What's going on guys, Justin here, and welcome to our 20th example video following our course on abstract algebra. Now, today's example video is gonna be all on maximal and prime ideals, so with my introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and get into our first example here. So for our first example, we wanna find all maximal ideals of Z15 cross Z12. So to begin this problem, let's go ahead and look at the ideals for Z15 and Z12 separately. So starting with Z15, we have at the very top just Z15 itself, and then we can split this up using the divisors of 15. So we can have, so we have the ideal generated by three and the ideal generated by five, and since those are the only uh, divisors of 15, that is all we will have except for the trivial ideal, which is just given by the singleton zero here. Great. And so the definition of maximal ideals is that you cannot fit an ideal in between, well, in this case, Z15 and the ideal. So in, for this problem, our maximal ideals will be, five, will be three and five. Great. So now let's go ahead and look at the maximal ideals for Z12, which is a bit more composite. So for Z12, we'll have Z12 at the top here, and then we will split this up until it's divisors. So we'll have the ideal generated by two, as well as the ideal, ideal generated by three. And those are the only prime divisors of 12, as we have two squared and three. So continuing this here, we have the ideal generated by four, as well as the ideal generated by six, which we connect which we can connect to from our two as well. And then lastly, we have just the trivial zero, singleton zero down here at the bottom. And so we can see for this one, our maximal ideals will be two and three as well. So to find the maximal ideals of Z15 and Z12, we just need to take the cross product of the maximal ideals from both. So our combination for those will be the ideal generated by three cross the ideal generated by two, then we'll have three cross three, and then we'll have five cross two, and then lastly, we will have five cross three. Great, so let's go ahead and get to our next problem. So for this problem, we're going to let R be the, the ring of all continuous functions from R to R, and we want to consider the subring I, which is defined as the following set, which is all functions which are in our ring R, such that f of zero equals f of one, which is equal to zero. Now in the previous example video, example video 19, we showed that this was in fact an ideal. So now we wanna show that it is not a prime ideal, and we're gonna do this by way of contradiction. So let's, by way of contradiction, suppose that I is a prime ideal. And then we're gonna use the definition of prime ideal and see if we can find some sort of counterexample or contradiction. Great, so we're gonna suppose uh, I is a prime ideal. Then for some, let's just call them A and B, which are in our ring R. And that it, with A times B being in I, we have the following, and that is that A is in I, or B is in I, and of course this is a logical or, so A and B could both be in I. So to come to our contradiction, we want to find an A and a B, which are, we wanna find an A times B, which is in I, where A is not an I and B is not an I. So here is the example I will give for that. So let's go ahead and consider the following functions. Let's consider f of x is equal to x, and let's consider g of x is equal to one minus x. And these are very clearly continuous functions from r to r. And let's just call this a and call this b, just so we can keep our notation from above. So let's note that a times b of zero will be equal to the following, will be equal to zero, and that a times b of one will also be equal to zero. However, we have that f of zero is equal to zero, but that is not equal to f of one, which is simply equal to one, which means that f of x is not in our ideal. And we also have that g of zero is equal to one, which is not equal to g of one, which is equal to zero, and that means that g of x is also, I should have said, not in i. Great, so we have the product of two functions which are in our ring R is in the ideal, but we have that neither of those functions is in the ideal, so this cannot be a prime ideal. And thus, with this counterexample, we have a contradiction. 
So let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this one, we want to show without assuming that R is a commutative ring, that if M, which is a subring of R, is an ideal, so that R mod M is a field, that that means that M is a maximal ideal. So to start off this proof, let's go ahead and suppose that R mod M is a field, and also that I, which is a subring of R, is an ideal. And we want it to be an ideal such that M is not equal to I, which is a subring of R. So what we're trying to do is find an I, which is in between R, M, and R, R. Without loss of generality, we're going to say that that is strictly bigger than M, but we could also say it is strictly less than R, but we're gonna to wanna to prove that it is impossible for an I to exist between our M and our R without it being M or R. And by our assumption here, we're going to be proving that I is equal to R. So we've started with the supposition that I is a sub, <coughs> that I is a subring of R. So all we wanna do is prove that R is a subring of I, and then we will have that they are equal and thus prove that M is a maximal ideal. So like I said, what we wanna show is that I is equal to R. And we're gonna do that in the following way. We are going to take an element, let's just call it A, from I minus M. So that is all things that are in I but not in M. But that means that A plus M must be in our quotient group R mod M. And also just verbally say that it must be non-zero. And so next we wanna take a B plus M, which is also in our quotient group R mod M. We wanna take it such that a plus M times B plus M is equal to one plus M. Well, we can combine these using coset rules for rings, which we proved in the corresponding lecture video to rewrite this in the following way, where we have A B plus M is equal to one plus M. But by definition, that means that A B minus one must be in M. And I want to note that A times B is in I and M is a subring of I. So combining these two things, we have that one must be in I. And so from here, all we need to do is take a little r, which is in our ring big R, since we have a multiplicative identity here. And using the fact that we have a multiplicative identity, that means we can write r as r times one, which of course must be in I, but that means that since we took an arbitrary element of r, and showed that it was in I that we have that R is a subring of I, and thus because of our assumption at the top that I was a subring of R, that we have that I is equal to R, which completes our proof. We tried to fit an arbitrary subring in between M and R and showed that it had to be R. Great, so that finishes this proof off, so let's go ahead and get into another one. So for this one, we wanna find the nil radical of the ideal four in Z36. Now, this is gonna be pretty straightforward if we just use the definition of the nil radical, so let me go ahead and get that written out for you now. So the definition of the nil radical of the ideal four is going to be as follows. We'll denote that as the square root of four here, as is standard, and that's gonna be equal to all A, which are in Z36, such that A to the N is equal to four times K, with K being in the integers and N being a natural number. And just, just to recall, we are not considering zero a natural number in this case. But if a to the n is equal to four times k, that means that two must divide a to the n, which of course means that two must divide a. But if two divides a, that means that a must be in the ideal generated by two. We have found a definition for our a in, in the no radical of the ideal four. Great, so let's go ahead and do another one. So for this one, we wanna show that the ideal generated by x squared plus x plus one, which is a subring of z3 adjoined x, is not a maximal ideal. And we're gonna do this using the theorem that I mentioned earlier, which is that a subring m is a maximal ideal if and only if the quotient group, which in this case would be z3 adjoined x mod out x squared plus x plus one is a field. So what we're gonna to do to show that it's not a maximal ideal is show that it is that the quotient group is not a field. And like I said, those statements are equivalent. So I'll just write down what I said. So we know that x squared plus x plus one is a maximal ideal, which I'll just abbreviate MI, if and only if R mod M is a field, which in this case, this will be our R and this will be our M. So R mod M will be equal to Z3 adjoin X mod out our polynomial here, X squared plus X plus one. Great. 
So what we want to do is show that our mod m is not a field. And like I said, doing so will prove that our ideal is not a maximal ideal. And we're going to do this using the following facts. So what I want to note is that in z3, negative 2 is equal to 1, which allows us to rewrite our polynomial in the following way. We have that x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to x squared minus 2x plus 1. Like I said, just given this fact right here and using z3. But that means we can factor this polynomial in z3 adjoined x. And we can factor it into the following form, and that will be x minus 1 squared. But that's going to be a problem as x minus 1 squared, which is equal to 0, is in z3 adjoined x mod the ideal generated by our polynomial x squared plus x plus 1. But x minus 1 equals 0 quotient group z3 adjoined x mod our polynomial ideal here, x squared plus x plus 1. And this is a problem because since our quotient group, which I'll just abbreviate r mod m, has non-zero nilpotent elements, it cannot be a field. And that is by a previous result. And since our quotient group is not a field, that means that m is not a maximal ideal by that result, which is in the lecture video. Great, so that finishes this example off. So let's go ahead and get into our last one. So for our last example in this example video, we're gonna let R be a commutative ring and N be equal to the set of all X in the ring R such that X to the N is equal to zero for some N in the natural numbers, which is exactly the definition of the set of all nilpotents. We wanna prove that the quotient group R mod N has no non-zero nilpotents. Great, and we're gonna do this by just taking an arbitrary element from R mod N and showing that it must be equal to zero. So let's go ahead and do that now. So just to start us off, I want to go ahead and note that the set of all nilpotents N is in fact an ideal. I'm not sure if we went over that in the lecture video or not, so I'm just gonna state that as a fact. So let's begin by supposing that we have A plus N is nilpotent in our quotient group, which we will denote R mod n. Now we can just use our definition of it being nilpotent, but by the definition of it being nilpotent, that means that zero is equal to a plus n to an exponent, let's just call it little n. But we can use the definition of taking the power of a coset like this to write this as a to the n plus n. And this zero is zero in the quotient group R mod n, so more accurately, we could write that as zero plus n. So let me just go ahead and get rid of this zero on this end here so it's more clear. So by the definition of a plus n being nilpotent in the quotient group R mod n, if we take a plus n to some natural number power, it is equal to zero plus n, or rather zero in the quotient group in this case. And this will be, like I said, for some, not for all, n greater than zero, or more accurately, a natural number. But by the definition of cosets, this is going to mean that a to the n is in n, and n is the set of all nilpotents. So that means that a to the n is also nilpotent. And we can use the definition of a to the n being nilpotent now. So if a to the n is nilpotent, that means that a to the n to some additional power, let's just call it k, is equal to is equal to zero. But we can rewrite this a to the n to the k in the following way as a to the n k, which is also equal to zero. But if a to some natural number power is equal to zero, that's the exact definition of a being nilpotent. And like I said, this is for some k greater than zero. So like I said, that is the exact definition of a being nilpotent. So if a is nilpotent, that means that a is in n, as n is the set of all nilpotents. But that means that a plus n must be equal to 0 plus n. So that finishes our proof off here, as we took an arbitrary nilpotent from our quotient group r mod n and showed that it must be 0. Great. So that finishes this last problem off, and that's a good place to stop.